everyone. It's July 18th, 2018, and this is your episode 157 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Kangelosi, and with me as usual are Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles. How's it going? Hey, everybody. Doing well? Ben, you know our baby has discovered the cat now, and he gets so excited. And it's really funny for us because... We used to try to show him the cat and he doesn't, it like didn't register, you know, it didn't, he didn't put eyes, nose and mouth together, but now he does. And he thinks she's just hilarious. My, uh, my brother's dog has, uh, taken to the role of guard dog of my nephew. It's pretty cute. <laughs> and our, our cat does absolutely nothing with the baby. She avoids him at all costs and she's fearless. You know, there'll be a giant dog in the yard and she'll like, you know, she's not afraid of anything, but she just goes out of her way to step around the baby. It's hilarious. Well, you guys, our guest today is a very well-traveled performing virtuoso and educator. She's the director of percussion studies at Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. And actually, I mentioned Cedar City, Utah back on Jeremy Barnett's episode when we were talking about the Shakespeare theater. And I told you guys that there was, cause Jeremy was performing in the Shakespeare theater, like the shake, the globe theater in London. And I said that my parents used to take us uh, often down to Cedar city, which is about five hours South from where I grew up in Utah to this great Shakespeare festival that happened in Cedar city, Utah. So she's also commissioned and or performed countless new works for percussion by composers such as Donald Crockett and William Kraft, just to name a couple. A common thread in her various projects is the idea of cultural exchange, and she's featured on several Grammy-nominated CDs. She is such a, just a friendly, wonderful face to see every PASIC. I always look over at the Marimba One booth, and I kind of <laughs> see this swarm of red hair between her and Nicole. And it's it's always great to see Lynn Vartan. So how's it going, Lynn? It's great. Thanks, guys. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. We, are you in between traveling right now? I think Laurel told me you're going to Australia next. Is that right? Yeah, in like 48 hours, actually. That's a great <laughs> time so, to do a like, podcast. Yeah, it's perfect. The, the suitcase is out, and it's like that 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 age old thing of trying to navigate because it's winter there, but actually my first stop is in Fiji because why not? And so, yeah. And so it's like a uh, swimsuit and then winter jacket. Okay. So yeah, I'm off to, I'm off to Australia, New Zealand and Fiji in on Friday in just two days. And I'm there, I'm going to judge um, the Australian Percussion Academy marimba competition in Melbourne. So I think it's the fifth annual one. It's my first time there, and I'm super excited about it. Who hosts that one? I feel like I've heard of this one before. Yeah, Sir, it's Sergei Goloko, Golovko. Is, um, he's the one who hosts it. And I think the academy is uh, more of an educational-based academy. I think they have things like starting you know, young age, and they go all year round. They have all kinds of different concerts. And for five years now, they've been hosting this marimba competition. So... Cool. What put Fiji on the map for you as somewhere you wanted to go? <laughs> well, it's Fiji. <laughs> uh, you know, I've never been to that. I mean, as much as I've traveled and I am so, I love traveling so, so, so much. I've never been to that part of the world at all. And I mean, I've just heard so, so much about how long the flight is and everything that I figured, well, let's see what else I can do there. And I have some friends in New Zealand and they were saying, well, you know, Fiji's gorgeous. And then one of the people that's traveling with me really wanted to go to Fiji. So we thought, okay, well, let's, start there and kind of transition into the winter environment. So yeah, starting there, we're just spending, I think, four or five days there and then into Australia. And then the last stop will be um, New Zealand, Auckland and Wellington and maybe Christchurch. We're still kind of finalizing the run around there. So Ben, it looks like you have something there. Yeah. So I was poking around on Lynn's website and I had a, a couple of things I wanted to, to ask about to get to eventually. But before we get to those, and our, we have this, as everyone probably knows at this point, we keep a text chat running while we do the, the podcast just for us to sort of coordinate. And I made this joke when Casey was doing the introduction about how our guest today has possibly the best hair of any percussionist in the world. 
And like Casey Absolutely. said, when you look over at the Marimba One booth at Hasek, you always see this like presence of, of Lynn standing around there. And when I was poking around on your website, I saw that one of your favorite musicians slash performers is Evelyn Glennie. And like when I think of the sort of like the diva of percussion, Evelyn Glennie is someone that obviously, in addition to being an outstanding player, just has such a presence. And I was wondering if you could talk about how Evelyn maybe influenced you in your career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Evelyn Glennie was, you know, a, a real primary influence. I mean, especially early on. I mean, you know, our, we're so fortunate. I mean, our, our field has exploded in the last 20 years, you know, but I mean, when I was kind of coming up and getting going, I mean, Evelyn Glenny was, I mean, she was like the most amazing and she was it, she was the one doing it. And I mean, I think that as I was getting going with percussion, you know, it was the whole package of, of being a performer and this idea of the kind of music that that we play um, and bridging that into, you know, outside of the classical realm and into other realms that may involve, you know, either pop culture or fashion or being on the cutting edge. And she just really symbolized that. And she had that combination of, you know, just, just of course, primarily amazing musicianship and just really creative, but then also that strength and that just force of nature, beauty, passion, all these things that it just kind of really resonated with me and, and sort of started off from there. And, and now, I mean, it's come to be sort of a thing, you know, like, I mean, I, you know, what clothes you're going to wear, what color is your hair? And it, I mean, that's more just fun because I like that kind of stuff and um, definitely has been a topic of conversation. I mean, it's so funny. It's kind of a running joke that almost every masterclass, you know, when you open up for questions afterwards, like the very first question is, okay, how do you play in heels? You know, like that's the thing that right. everybody wants to know about. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's just fun. It's become a fun, like part of it for me. But Evelyn Glennie was a huge inspiration. I mean, I was able to see her, you know, live in, in Los Angeles and in California and just, um, you know, she, and then the other major influence who also has awesome fashion sense would be Steve Schick. Um, uh, who was teaching in Fresno, you know, when I was a little one. And so, um, you know, that th those two, both of them, the influences were really strong for so many reasons. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, I, there was an article that Evelyn Gl Glennie wrote a while back, and I, I can't ever find it anymore. I remember it was on her website. But you're talking about the sort of extra musical elements of a performance, like how the performer looks. And the uh, you know, like the stuffy classical old musician would say, well, that doesn't matter. It's all about, you know, the music. And at one rate, that is true. But at a second rate, if I'm going to see a performance and there's something costume wise or lighting wise or something that can enhance the performance, uh, I think that's totally legitimate and, and should be put into play. And Evelyn talks about in this article, I remember she was performing at Walt Disney Concert Hall. And, you know, it's this amazing concert hall that has all these lighting possibilities and she wanted, I think it was like red gels thrown on the lights, nothing, nothing major. And they said, well, we, we can't do that for a classical concert. And it's, I mean, it, there could have been something else at play. It could have been like a union thing or something. I don't know. But like, yeah, it's, it's so interesting to me that uh, so many people are hesitant to think about these other considerations. And I think it's maybe because you start to feel like not a serious musician when you're debating, you know, what color nail polish will make for the best performance because it it won't but it'll it will i think affect the audience's perception and i just i find it so funny watching you know junior recitals how many people are just awkward taking a bow on stage and that can distract yeah. performance i think well you know it's a tricky topic because like at the very first and foremost and this is something that i'm really passionate about in my teaching and my own playing you have to be yourself you know so like, it's hard to say, I mean, for me, it wouldn't matter if I was a percussionist or if I was a, you know, a author or whatever, I would still like, that's part of who I am, you know? And so I think being really, really natural to yourself and knowing yourself, that's, that's the first thing. And if that includes this, these elements, then great. But if it doesn't, and you're not comfortable with that, then you, you definitely shouldn't force it, at least in my opinion. I'm, 
And then the other thing about it is that, you know, classical music is tricky. I mean, we have we ha we have so many things to navigate, not just as percussionists, but in the bigger world of classical music. And to bring up Disney Hall, I mean, I wonder when that was because, you know, that's evolved a lot. Now they're doing so much with film and cr like really advanced lighting and all different textures and things like that. And when you think about, you know, what are people going to see and who is our audience and do we want our classical music audience to be different than a pop music audience? I mean, who do we want, who, who should be listening? Who do we want to listen? And so navigating all that, it's a tricky topic, you know, so, but you have to do what works for you first and foremost, I think. I think it's great. Those of us who found like a visual theme and I have not, I, I feel like I, I think it's important to look good. Cause when I look good, I feel good. And I feel, if I feel good, I feel like I can perform well. <laughs> like I like, I like the idea of people looking at me and thinking like, Oh, he looks good. And it's like, they just give you this confidence that you need to play. But yet I've found such little consistency. Like I can't find what I look like. I'm very sure about how I play and like how I like what I like to do on stage, but I'm still not sure how I look. Ben, I think you've figured this out. I feel like you've always got red pants. Is that right? Yeah, that's that was a, a thing that started in Miami. I just decided, well, I was looking at my colleagues, males always just wore all black on stage, or percussionists wore all black, and then the wind players would wear, string players wear a suit. And then I watched these pianists, female pianists, do these recitals in these, you know, gorgeous, big, flowing gowns. And uh, I tried the gown thing for a couple of us. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I was kind of jealous that females had these beautiful outfits to wear and we just wore all black. And I think yeah. for some performers that can work very well and I'm not knocking it. And uh, I think was, I think Rob Knopper is kind of an all black guy. Gary Burton is certainly an all black guy if you read his, his autobiography. But for me, I just wanted something I thought would kind of pop on stage and I was reading a biography of Dieter Rams who is a famous designer I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, sort of German brawn industrial design but he said that uh, I could find the exact quote if I really wanted to right now but he said that brawn always used color very sparingly and in a very sort of shocking way that would stand out so for example the on indicator on a product would be red and everything else would be black so there would be no mistaking that's where your attention should be and so just I think the small pop of color on stage for me was was an interesting thing. Cameron Leach wrote an, like a blog entry about this like a month or two ago. I and, heard about that. Yeah, he has this sort of blazer thing going. Um, so, you know, to each his own. But, um, yeah, I, I think that certain people can pull off all black just fine. And, I mean, you know, I think about Yo-Yo Ma, who looks great in a tux. And I wouldn't want Yo-Yo Ma in red pants on stage. I think that looks weird. <laughs> But I think, it, you know, it's also if Yo-Yo Ma is performing Bach versus me performing some contemporary work, it's it's a different thing. Right. Um, one of my one of my favorite percussion outfits is uh, Paul Rennick talked about, got a decade or two ago, Evelyn Glennie came to UNT and played Michael Doherty's UFO. And he said he met her backstage beforehand and she had on this aluminum foil jumpsuit. <laughs> He's like, what the hell is she wearing? And then he said... In his very sort of Paul Philly accent, he said, then I saw her on stage playing. I was like, that's exactly what she should have wore. <laughs> and that piece starts out with that huge water phone movement where you're like in the yeah. in the audience with the water phone and like making with the headset on and everything. It's crazy. So that's perfect. Yeah. Well, Casey, you have a lot of visual stuff in your work, though. I mean, your pieces. I mean, you you do a lot of. I mean, you have that, that, that is really a, an element of your composition and performance style. And I mean, I think that's amazing too. I mean, that definitely draws the viewer in as well as the listener, but that, that element of it is also cool. Oh, thanks a lot. And, and I, I think there is, yeah, I feel comfortable all, all there, you know, it's like, there's kind of several unifying themes and the recitals and the programming it's oh yeah i feel like i've got a lot of control of that but i think sort of like like ben was saying the male female thing i feel like as guys we're kind of just stuck to very few options and i don't hold know on, if i can pull on, off please. red pants you know laurel literally makes clothes <laughs> right we should i should figure that out <laughs> hey she made the shirt i'm wearing can you believe that no wow. yeah she made the shirt. she made ben a shirt too she can make guys shirts like incredibly well that's yeah. amazing that's so cool it's my best fitting shirt bar none that's it 
like tailored to your body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben, it looks like you have a question. And then it looks like Laurel has her hands free for the moment. So we might go to her topic after your question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have two questions. I, you said Laurel made me a shirt. Laurel made me like 90% of a shirt and then said she needed to like finish it. And I still haven't gotten it. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Do you know how long it takes to make a shirt? No, I know. Casey just said that you made me one. I was like, oh, news to me. <laughs> <laughs> ben, she's made me several shirts, just so you know. Uh, she likes you better. That could be. Um, <laughs> well, I <can> hope so. <laughs> right? But we're, you were talking about, uh, Lynn, you were talking about being yourself, sort of finding yourself. And I think part of this, if we were to sway the pendulum back to the sort of musical side of things, is finding your own sound. And Casey has used this podcast to push his mallets extensively. Um, so, so I wanted to give you a chance and tell us about the creation of your mallets and what you found you liked in a sound and all that sort of thing. That's great. That's a great question. And I mean, I love talking about it because it, the process, and I mean, you know, Casey can maybe attest to that for me, at least the process of designing a line of mallets was actually quite a bit different than I thought going in, you know, as a little kid, I was like, Oh, want my signature sticks you know like we all like want that and I was like they're gonna be like black shafts with like you know bling and I mean you know I want it you know you just kind of like dream the world and then it and then you start thinking about it more and when it actually comes down to it like okay we're gonna do this so you're gonna have an artist series what does that mean and that for me the the exploration of that was really really interesting and amazing. It made me really take a look at, you know, well, yeah, what do I want to say? What legacy or, how, you know, what kind of history or what do I want to say with these mallets about my sound, about who I am as a player? And one of the things that came up in, in, in the process and in discussions was that I am really passionate about education, you know, and, and that has been certainly, a, a, in addition to performing, that's been a hallmark of, of, of my career. And, and with that, you know, thinking about, okay, well, how do I tie that in? I mean, an artist series mallet usually is like, get these mallets and you'll have, you'll, it's my sound, you know? And I kind of wanted to do something actually a little bit different um, because one of the things that always comes up in master classes and in teaching is like, oh my gosh, we have to buy hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mallets and uh, we have to have specific mallets for specific pieces. So the idea that started to develop for me was this, this idea of the just right fit. Like, um, I play both grips. I play Steven's grip and I play like a modified kind of Burton style grip. And so the idea of like, well, what's the perfect weight of a mallet? What's the perfect head of a mallet? What's the perfect this? What's the... it was hard for me to pin down because, you know, I do those different things and play, of course, marimba and then multi-percussion, all these things. So I started to develop this idea of this just right fit. The idea of an artist series mallet, where if you had the whole set, you you could really kind of play anything. You could it would cover you for basically any piece, anything you wanted. That's kind of the idea where we started. So then we wanted it also to be cost effective because that's another aspect of it is that you know it starts getting expensive. So this series has four models. It has a, a soft mallet, a medium mallet a hard mallet. And then the fourth, which is the hardest of them is actually a combo marimba vibraphone mallet. Um, they all have round heads. They're, um, the weight varies, like the soft mallet's a little on the heavy side, the medium mallet's more medium, the vibraphone combo mallet is on the lighter side. Um, they're all round heads. The vibraphone mallet is mushroom shaped. Um, and then I wanted them to definitely be both sold in birch and rattan, um, again, to kind of like be the mallet that's available for everyone. So that's kind of the philosophy behind it, that it's the artist series sort of for everyone, the just right fit, you know, like kind of like the Goldilocks thing, you know, it's not too hard, not too soft, not too heavy, not too light. And then it doesn't matter if you play Steven's grip, you'll be comfortable with it. If you play Burton grip, you'll be comfortable with it. 
Um, if you want something that's really articulate, you can get it to do that. If you want something, um, you know, you can mix and match. A couple things that are unique about it, um, it is, and I don't know what the future holds for Marimba One in terms of vibraphone mallets, but it's the first um, exploration outside of just marimba mallets it's that combo mallet is really intended to be a combo use mallet that you could use on vibraphone and on marimba or for stack setups that kind of thing the other thing is that it's the first um in marimba in marimba one that you can buy a graduated set so in addition to buying pairs of soft pairs of medium pairs of hard you can actually buy a graduated set that is um, from low to high, soft, medium, medium, hard. So that's kind of the little spiel behind them. So if you have any questions about them, but that's kind of the, that's what we were going for. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Ben, did you have another question or should we move to Laurel? I was just going to ask how they sound on Triangle. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, well, they sound awesome. Because <laughs> oh, I just lie. I just say, well, now it sound great. Use them on Triangle, Symphony, <laughs> just whatever. Just buy them. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Laurel, for the, for the moment, it looks like your hands are free and uh, Robin's giving you a little break. So we should probably mm. do your topic while we can. <laughs> Yes, yes. And first, I want to say I'm stoked that they're sold in a graduated set, Lynn, yeah. because that's that's what we guide everybody towards now anyway. And it's so much more cost effective. And it's just logically what makes sense. So that's yeah. really exciting. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Yeah. Okay, everybody. So today I want to share with you uh, an idea called the lemming conspiracy. And I came across this in my reading of this book called Don't Waste Your Talent, which is part of this uh, training that I'm getting to be certified in this certain psychological technique, which is really cool, which I'll tell you about when I'm done. Um, but the lemming conspiracy is this idea that we have our system selves and then our true selves, and that life is kind of this path of balancing the dichotomy between the two. So the name of this comes from the lemmings, those little animals and their sort of urban myth that they tend to commit mass suicide off the edges of cliffs. They just follow one another. More about Is that. that not true? And, yeah, it's not true. Oh. Um, and I'll explain more about that later. But uh, we didn't know that wasn't true, I think, before the book was written. So <laughs> hence why it's named the Lemmy Conspiracy. And when it comes to those systems that I mentioned, these are really different things. They can be our professional lives the careers, kind of the field at large. It could be training for the field. So maybe it's school. It could be a family. It could be your friends and what they think of you. And it's sort of the role that your system puts you in versus maybe the role that you intrinsically feel you're supposed to have. And I, I had to step out earlier, but I'm wondering if, if Lynn said something that is really along those lines a few minutes ago when I had to step away. And basically, um, the system self and true self are didn't different. Your true self has these talent, skills, and interests and drives, and the system self has used those to get to where it is. But inevitably, we'll all kind of get to this point, sometimes it's called a midlife crisis, where you realize that those two things aren't congruent and that you've kind of played into the idea that, for example, I just need to keep going in the field and keep getting promoted, keep moving up. If I can have the same kind of lifestyle that this person has who I look up to, then I'll feel settled and then I can deal with these other parts of my life. Or it could be even something more specific, like I want a black Range Rover and I want these type of chrome wheels. And once I have those, then I can think about other things. But until then, I'm just focused and I'm staying with this. <laughs> so when you're part of the limiting conspiracy, you tend to not notice that you're playing more into the system than listening to yourself. And the systems are not inherently evil. It's not like the field is trying to make you be someone you're not. It's not like your teachers are making you be someone or even your family and friends who are trying to help. If you say like, I'm confused, I'm not sure what's going on. You know, they have this view of you and they're just trying to share it with you to try to be helpful. It's all the best intentions, but it is still a system. And so we have to figure out how to sift through information coming from the system and information coming from yourself. 
In the Limit Conspiracy, according to the writers of this book, it affects virtually everybody at some point, but it can particularly affect those who are really bright and they call it successful, like people who work hard and tend to achieve things that they aim towards. And usually, if you have any type of career in music, you are that kind of person because you have to work so hard, as we all know. So, of course, born out of the warmest intentions of everybody and something that happens through the end of it is we get to this period of great stress. So I mentioned earlier, sometimes that could be a type of midlife crisis, which is something that we've all heard of, or it's just sort of you reach this turning point, maybe at the end of undergrad, the end of grad school, um, when you hit your late 20s and you're like, hmm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I kind of feel like I'm just spinning my wheels, but it's supposed to be meaningful. I don't know. Uh, they call those turning points. And when that hits, we enter into what they call the stress cycle, where we just get really focused on things that maybe aren't so important. And they say that it has three elements. And one of those is really short-term focus. So I mentioned this in thinking, you know, I'll get the promotion and then I'll get on with my life and things will be fine. So you get um, so focused on the task at hand that you can't see the bigger picture, that it becomes, you know, I have to get a job, I have to get a job, I have to win a position, and then I can think about other things. And um, uh, that that's not always the least stressful way to be. Another element of the stress cycle is worrying about wealth, power, and status. And they say a new car would feel great, a new house, maybe a second house. The promotion will mean that you're getting somewhere in life. You want to dress like your boss's dress and drive their cars. You want to have those kind of lifestyles. But maybe it's not in line with who you are if, to get there, you have to put aside who you are. And thirdly, someone else telling you what's important can really keep you in a really stressful place. So they mentioned getting a college degree, earning a lot of money, getting a position of responsibility and power. They're worthy goals if they are a direct expression of your personal vision, which is a term used by this psychological technique, which is their way of explaining, putting together every part of yourself, your interests, your values, your abilities, your skills to figure out kind of what direction you should go in uh, and how to get yourself out of that stressful cycle. And it's something that they offer as a way to leave the stressful cycle and exit the lemon conspiracy to where you're no longer just going through a system, but that you are being true to yourself and your own vision of yourself, even if you need to stay in that system. And we need to, we need jobs, we have families, like we need to stay part of those, but we also want to make sure that we're being true to who we are because that keeps us happy people, that keeps us effective people, that allows us to make differences in good ways. You know, so that's the lemon conspiracy in a nutshell. And as for the urban myth of them jumping off cliffs, that comes from this documentary that was made in the 1950s by uh, the Disney corporation or something. And they were up in Canada and looking at the little lemmings and lemmings are a lot like mice. They're kind of, they're a rodent. So they're like a mice, but a hamster, but a guinea pig. They're, you know, they're cute. And um, in the documentary, it shows them all running towards this cliff and then kind of falling down the side of it. And that's where this idea came that they commit mass suicide for some reason that nobody else can tell as if they're trapped in this systemic um, suicide trend. And we discovered in the 80s that the Disney producers bought lemmings from neighboring towns and filmed them just running over the terrain and then edited it so it looked like they jumped over the cliffs. So wait a minute. I saw a YouTube video of lemmings jumping into water off a cliff, but they don't die. It shows them swimming afterwards. Yeah, they can also swim. So the idea that they would all just drown because they can't swim is another part of the thing that's not true. And I've seen that video. Is it the one narrated clearly in an old-timey voice? Yes. Of like, the lemmings go here and they... Duh, duh, duh. It's yeah, more like, that's... lemmings go here and... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. That's from the documentary in the 50s. Right. 
so, it was definitely a, a documentary. So, yeah, and I was yeah. I thought, oh, I'll be so clever. I'll I'll partner with Laurel's topic and I'll find a sound of lemmings jumping into the water because yes. it's like so common, right? And I, I couldn't find it. Yeah, and yeah, and it turns out that it's just this. It's an urban myth yeah. that that they do that, but it is very strong. Obviously, there's. Yeah this theory named after it or a conspiracy i should say there's a video game called lemmings i think oh yeah so i don't know if you guys ever played the old game probably from the 80s old pc game where you're you're you have lemmings that keep dropping into the frame and they just march in a straight line and when they hit a wall they turn around and you're supposed to get them from point a to point b without them dying and they just like mindlessly march and you're supposed to give them little instructions like, okay, build a bridge here. Then they don't fall in the water there. And now dig a hole here. And oh, it was a nice little fun little puzzle game. But so, so Laura, I'm a little, I want to know is like, are they t- saying the lemon conspiracy is kind of a, a necessary discomfort we have to do? And it's sort of a engine behind how successful people keep stepping up. And, and it, it, like, is it a good thing? It's, they're saying that we all tend to end up in it at some point, and you know you're in it when you start to, like, something in your insides is kind of telling you, like, I'm something isn't right here, like, I'm working really hard, but it, it somehow doesn't fit me, and I don't know why hmm. um, that that's part of it, or, you know, thinking... I'm going to get this job and then I'm going to work six years and get tenure. And then I'm going to try to go to another school and then I'm going to do this and that and that that's just playing into it. Like, and you never settle and just be happy with what you have and where you're at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If in your research, I mean, is this kind of a concept that's more a U.S. concept or is it a worldwide concept? Because one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, I mean, I think things are a little different. I mean, I think the thought process and the, that the qualities of success and path to success and what a work day is and what a work week is, you know, I think it's a little different here than it is in other places of, in the world. And I'm, I'm curious if this research is more, or if it even says, if it's more sort of an, a U.S. based thing or if it's a worldwide sort of concept. I wouldn't, it does not label itself, but it is written by researchers here and the people who have taken part in the study are all from the U.S. So I, I would say it's definitely more representative of here. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Lynn, in your travels, would you, how would, how would you describe that for, for say Europeans? Cause I think I know exactly what you're, what you're getting at. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I, I tend to fine, we get into conversations. I mean, we have so many friends, all of us around the world. It's so amazing to have these kinds of conversations with them and just kind of talk about like, well, you know, how, how do you think about life right now? Or are you looking to the next thing? Cause I think that's a, a, like everything that you said. And when you brought this topic up, when I, when I heard about it for the first time, I was like, yeah, this describes a lot of what I see in students and what we experience. And, and, but when I talk to people, you know, abroad or have friends abroad and we start talking about it, there's a, a little more of a innate contentment with, um, you know, maybe just getting a good job, you know, and then, and then building your life around that, you know, and, and then I seem to feel like I see more and hear more contentment and joy with the projects and things that you can build around something, um, rather than that moving to the next, to the next, to the next, next, which is, which is definitely feeds that. I mean, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it for sure. When, when I'm at my worst, it's when I'm thinking of like, oh my gosh, you know, I should be doing this or I need to do this or, oh my gosh, I've been in Utah for 10 years, you know, this kind of thing. And that's when I think I'm at my worst, you know, and then, and then, but when I start thinking about like my friends and, and what they've said, and, and I start thinking more about this contentment based, and then what kinds of joy can I bring to new projects or new things in and around, you know, rather than searching for that next thing, like to push myself forward, 
I definitely feel better, you know, and, and I think that's what my my colleagues and friends abroad are, are expressing. I mean, it kind of goes back to the whole, you know, like European, even the Spanish siesta concept, right? Or the Italian concept of play to work or work to play, you know, and I think there's a lot of validity that we maybe miss on that. You know, we we are always like work, 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 work um, uh, all the time. Whereas I think a little more of a European tradition is, is that you work enough so that you can then have a very fulfilling life and you can play whatever that means for you, you know? So that's kind of, at least that's been my experience in talking to people. I, I feel like I've talked to my parents about this sort of thing before. And I, I, I feel like my dad described you know, the, American dream, you know, and like what it was, how like success has been very defined. And it seems like we're all getting a little more laid back about that now. But I guess there was a time when, no, that was very common to hear. And this is what success is. And you got to have a two door garage and you got to have uh, a wife and kids and a picket fence and home every day by five and summer vacation at the lake or whatever, you know, that was. I it's like that's what the American dream was, and, and yeah, maybe they just don't, they don't have that over there, so they're happier. <laughs> then I guess you hear the other side of people say like, no, that's that's why that's what makes America the best, because we all know America's like the best right now, you know, especially right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what do you got, Laurel? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that I, Lynn, I totally know what you mean, because I, I think of my friend Jeremy Barnett, who's been on the podcast from, he's from Australia. And as long as I've known him, he's just kind of had this attitude of like, it's all all right. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing what I like. That's what matters. You know, and there's, I'm sure he stresses about some things at some points, but um, it's not at the forefront of his mind. And I, yeah, and I start to wonder why, and I don't, I do not want to go down this path, but um, you know, how life is set up here, the system of earning and capitalism is different than Australia and a lot of European countries. And I wonder if um, some of that plays into this, you know, like here, if you want to be okay and have health insurance, yeah, you got to keep moving up. And yeah. in other places, it's not like that. And I wonder if that, I don't know if it's a comfort or something, or it's just one less worry, maybe. I don't know what I'm quite trying to say, but other than I, I hear and agree with what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ben, ben, thanks for putting those lemming pictures in the chat. That's really helpful. Yeah, they are really cute, actually. I don't want them to die. I'm happy to hear they don't. They don't. They don't die. Like, like well, I mean, I know they die, but they don't. <laughs> They're not in a mass suicide cult. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, I had this thing, and I was trying to, I heard that this is a Japanese concept, and I thought it was called Kaizen, but when I Googled, I found out maybe that's not what it is, and I think I've called it that before on the podcast, but anyway, I'll just go ahead and start talking. There's this concept of, um, I think it's a false dichotomy that wanting more means that you're not satisfied with what you have, um, and I think it's very important to both be satisfied with what you have and who you are as a person and to work toward that but to also work toward bettering yourself. And I think of many great musicians that, I mean, even ones at the top of the field, and I won't name names, but like, you know, someone that's won a big orchestral audition that hears everything wrong with their playing. And, that, you know, that person's like, oh, I suck. It's, you know, you, know, you, you just won the job for the, you know, XYZ Philharmonic. Like, that's a big deal. You don't suck. <laughs> um, but at the same rate, you know, you can't just think, oh, I'm the most awesome player in the world and I have nothing to work on because if you have nothing to work on, you probably have errors in your playing that you're not hearing. So I think it's important at, at any level for, you know, my freshman students all the way up to a professional working out in the field to both be content with who you are and what you have, as well as have a direction to where you're going. And I think that sort of Leaning back toward what Laurel was saying, I think the most important thing is that it's very you-centered and very much who you are and not comparing yourself to other people. And I know someone talked about, um, I can't remember who the two drummers were. I think one was Steve Gadd, and I don't remember who the other one was, but one drummer that was very successful you know, immediately at 20 years of age and was well-known and has had a long career. And then maybe, I think it was Steve Gadd, took longer for people to sort of notice him. And again, like very successful person, very long career. 
So I think that, yeah, you can see someone that wins that orchestra job and you're still struggling to make ends meet between all your little gigs in whatever town you're in. Um, and that's fine for that person. And it doesn't mean that you're less successful of a musician because you haven't won that job yet. And it's easier for me to say now that I've, you know, won a job, I certainly had those doubts and still have those doubts about myself. But, um, yeah, I think that, you know, as you're out of fresh out of grad school or fresh out of undergrad, trying to find your path, it can be very difficult to avoid comparing yourself to others. You want a job? College job, not an orchestra job. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm not that good. I suck. <laughs> no, you don't. What do you got, Laura? Yeah. Well, before we leave this topic altogether, I just wanted to mention that there are examples of people who did not listen to those around them who were, you know, trying to force them into their systems. And I hope I don't embarrass you, but Casey's one of those people. What? One of his teachers at, at some point said, you got to stop wasting your time with these compositions and you need to focus on this. Because Ooh. that's how you get a job. And was it you know, Casey Zeltzman? is who said that, Casey? I, I wasn't gonna <laughs> it was I not wasn't, Nancy Zeltzman. It was ah. not Nancy. I wasn't gonna say. Um you know, but I I would take a guess that everybody that's how you know him and that's a huge part of his identity. And if he had just listened and assumed that that was the correct advice. Um right. yeah. no, that's a good point. Thanks a lot. Yeah, oh sure. But I meant I would think you'd spent a lot of unhappy time, you know, and 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 to that that person's credit, they're doing they're saying this is the path I know. And if yeah. you want to if you want to go with that path, this is what you'll have to do. You know, yeah. it, it was so interesting for me last week to hear Bill Mersh talk about uh, he took a couple auditions when he was in New York just because he was there. It was, the, you know, the cost of the, the subway fare to get to the New York Phil audition or whatever. And Charlie Owen wrote him and discouraged him from taking those. And it wasn't because he didn't think he could win it or anything like that. He just said, you went there to be a soloist and you're, you're getting so close. Why would you give that up? And I think that's, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, Lynn, I was going to ask you a little bit about this podcast you've been doing for the last year or so. Lynn, Lynn has this wonderful podcast she hosts that's not just a music or percussion podcast exclusively, but it's your whole college of what, performing arts? Actually, it's the university as a whole, and it, it sort of is a great like dovetail from that last conversation because I totally agree that it has a like all of this, everything has so much to do with really knowing yourself and being true to yourself. You know, going back to the identity thing, like when we first started talking, um, for me, you know, I was starting to feel a little bit restless, you know, a, a couple years back. And um, I, I worked super hard to build the program here and doing all kinds of great things. And everything was great, but I sort of wanted maybe a new challenge or I don't know, just a little of that, that restlessness was creeping in. And, um, so for me, what I did was kind of just keep my eyes and ears open and, and stay open to like a lot of possibilities. And something came across my desk, which is that we have at Southern Utah University, um, a lecture series, and it used to be called a convocation series. And basically it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like Ted talks and there's like weekly Ted talk shows. And, um, it was, it's a faculty position where you can take that on and do that as part of your faculty load. Um, and it worked out great for me. I was like, wow, this seems really exciting. And I'd love to get exposed to all these people and different people, you know, from all over different areas. Like, and, and, and I could tell you about some of them, everything from like people who research big wave surfing to somebody who was, um, on the ground in Darfur to, you know, it just, it goes on and on and on and on. And so I applied for that and got that position as the director of it. And then took about a year to rebrand the whole thing. And so so now it's called Apex Events, um, and Apex stands for Ask, Ponder, Educate, and then the X we kind of put in a parenth like in a like a like a variable in math because the topic changes every week. And so I run this series as part of my assignment. And um, the thing that I gave up to do it, it was actually worked out pretty well. Is that um, a lot of people don't know that I, I have a pretty big background in marching percussion, and when I was living in California, it was 
um, running a drum line in Thousand Oaks and all this kind of stuff. And so I was doing the drum line at Southern Utah and a lot of people were like, what, you know, and, and, but yeah, I did that. And so it was kind of an even trade because that's sort of a lot of extra work and, um, and then uh, go in to do uh, do this Apex events. And so as part of Apex events, I well, what I do is I host these weekly series and bring speakers and scholars from all over the world to campus. And then I was interviewing people on stage as kind of like the little Q&A after the talk. And a bunch of people kept coming up to me and was like, oh, I really like the way you ask questions. And it'd be cool if you like did an interview. And we have this great radio station. It's Thunder 91.1 on campus. And this really great, like it's a whole full-blown professional radio station. So I approached them and said, you know, what do you think about me doing an hour on the show, you know, an hour long show? And they said, yeah, we'd love for faculty to be more involved with the radio station. And so, and I said, well, can you record it? Can we turn it into a pot? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. We can record it off directly off the machines. And, and so I got a training on it. And now we have this radio show that's um, during the school year, it's Thursdays at 3 p.m. And then we record it and turn it into a podcast. And the podcast is called The Apex Hour. Um, shameless plug. It's on iTunes and Google Play and anywhere you get your podcast. And it's really fun. And it's um, basically the speakers who come on campus, they come and do this really personal radio show interview that's much more casual. So you really get like more insight to them and we talk like personally as opposed to just their their kind of lecture on stage. So yeah, it's called the Apex Hour. And I mean, it is really just like, I'm so passionate about this because we get a little tunnel vision, I think in music sometimes, or at least maybe I can get a little tunnel vision. I don't know about anybody else. Sure. But for me to like explore, we had uh, this amazing woman who's one of the directors of user experience at Google come in and talk about the AI that they're built, it was just amazing, you know, and, and, and then this, this uh, big, this surfer, this woman who researches all the big waves and has researched sharks. She used to be the editor in chief for O magazine. And like, it just goes on and on and on. And, and, um, we're starting our fall season with Gustavo Ariano, who wrote tacos USA, how Mexican food conquered the world. And we're going to do like a taco mm -hmm. event. And, you know, so it's, it's everything. It's fun. There's research. Uh, we've, we've had, you know, we've had, in fact, we, Glenn Velez, Glenn and Loir came as one of the music guests because I thought their style of music would be really amazing for our student body because it's so different, so unique. And so they've come for, you know, and, and so it's all, it's not just music or performing arts, it's science, it's, you know, authors, it's all kinds of stuff. Um, in fact, I don't know if anybody is up on like the Theranos um, the, the Theranos kind of conspiracy uh, that came up there. It's kind of a long story, but it's really cool. And the, the whistleblower for that, it's this woman, it's called the biggest scandal in Silicon Valley in like the last 10 years. It's about this woman who passed off this blood testing system that apparently was fake or didn't work. Um, I, have, I need to read the book. And the book, the whistleblower who wrote the book, it's called Bad Blood. And the guy's name is John Carreyrou. Anyway, it's making, it's all the New York Times bestseller list and everything like that. He's going to be one of our speakers in March. So, oh, um, you cool. know, it's, it's everything. So that's been something that's really kind of brought a whole new kind of passion to my life. And of course that spills right into my music, into my practicing and I feel like just kind of makes, you know, just, just gets me excited about the world and because there's so much out there. So yeah, yeah that's like, the, that's, man, who wouldn't want to do that? Especially if it's part of your workload. Yeah. That's it's amazing. Great. And so it's one of those things, like you were saying, going back to the lemming thing and, and, and the way, the way we get through those moments, I mean, this is something like if you told me five years ago, I would never I would be like, what? You're going to be running a talk show like that doesn't make any sense, you know, but it's just something that if you keep your if you keep your like heart and mind open to stuff, then things can can happen. And maybe they're in completely areas you would never even know, but can really make a huge difference in your life. So this is something that I'm really excited about. That's great. Well, I, got, I have a question about this. Uh, you're kind of talking broadly about, I, I think about this a lot too, because especially I like to read, and when I read something that's not necessarily music related, 
I often find parallels or ways to, to link it into my practice or my thoughts about the arts or something like that. Have there, could you pinpoint like maybe one or two examples of things that you just found fascinating that you somehow were able to translate into your art form? Yeah, so that's a great question. Going back to this woman from Google, her name is uh, Elizabeth Churchill. She's phenomenal. She, uh, one of her main things is she uh, puts teams together to work on projects, right, at Google. And, and these are like high, big brain projects. And she talked about her team management um, and the way that she balances letting people run with things and yet still kind of running the team. And so, you know, her dis the way she talked about how she manages her team was for me completely enriching to use in my teaching. And I really immediately started thinking about those kinds of things and, and how you, you know, how you deal with teams and how you move people forward and how you inspire people and keep and direct them and all these kinds of things. So that's just one example of, of stuff that I was able to, to use right off the bat. Another is the writers that come in. I always ask them about, you know, their writing process, like this, this concept, does the muse come and like, you know, strike you, oh, or do you have to like drag the muse by the head, whatever that, you know, you hit them over the head and drag them into the room, you know? And so when you talk to authors about the, how they write, um, that's one of the things also that I, I always relate that right back to practicing in music because they talk about their process and how, how how much of a craft it is. I mean, writing, just like practicing, it's not like, oh, the, the, the sky opened and these words just poured out of me. No, you're you're constantly writing and rewriting and you know assessing and analyzing and, and I mean that's what we do when we're preparing pieces. So those are a couple examples of, of how it's been directly applicable but applicable back to music. So Laurel wants to ask, she's got her hands full right now, but she suspects you might be into yoga. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally into yoga. How did you how, know? <laughs> how did Laurel know? Is it, does it have to do with this, this uh, tapestry hanging above uh, the mallets? This, this tapestry is more, uh, it's kind of like an African thing. It's not so much yoga, um, but I am super into yoga. Yoga is like the, the thing that has like stuck uh, in terms, I've tried like, I like being athletic and I like moving and I've kind of tried a lot of different things over the years, but yoga is something I got involved with very, very, very early on. And it's the thing that has stuck with me, you know, through the years for so, so, so many reasons. Um, one, uh, I love I love how it feels in my body. That's that's just, I, I love the strength that it gives me. I love the flexibility that it gives me. I love, um, I just feel like it, it, it loosens and oils me in a way that I, that makes me really comfortable in my playing too. So there's that. Um, the other thing about it is how it grounds me. I mean, you can tell by how I talk, like I'm, I'm always like talking fast and like moving fast and like, ah, you know, all this and yoga just is really gives me all the tools to like, you know, just, just take that time and, and mellow out. And, um, I love how you can do it anywhere. I love how you, it teaches you how to be kind of okay with anything. Like again, going back to when you feel uncomfortable or when you feel maybe you're going into one of those lemming times, um, yoga is great because if you're in a real, if you're in a pose that's hard and uncomfortable, yoga teaches you that like, that's okay. Like just breathe and it's okay to be uncomfortable for a little while. You know, you just, that's okay. You know, and, and, right. um, that has been really valuable for me in life. So I love yoga and, um, you can find some great stuff on YouTube if you want to get involved with it. Um, also yoga anytime is a great like app that you can get on Roku or anything like that to supplement, like going to a class. We can start at home and then supplement it with a class. Um, I mostly practice at home, but I take my mat, like my mat's already packed in my suitcase for Australia. So yeah, I love yoga. It's great. Ben, I think we have a Facebook question there. Actually, I, I have a question I'd like to ask first. Because yeah. speaking of yoga, that reminds me of uh, I saw on your website that you worked with Michael Colgrass. And yes. I know that he's, I don't know if he practices yoga, but I, I know I've heard him talk extensively about like yoga and Tai Chi and these sorts of movements. So yeah. I was wondering if you could tell us what your involvement was with Michael Colgrass. 
So when I was at USC, I did I did all of my um, graduate work at USC. My master's and my doctorate were at USC, and I was heavily involved with um, contemporary chamber music and the contemporary music ensemble. And I was working on um, you know his um, solo piece, Te Tuma Te Papa. Uh, it's, it's an older piece now, but it's a five movement work that sort of takes up the whole stage and, and all of that. And I'd been working on it and the director of the contemporary music ensemble said, Hey, you know, we're, we're bringing, we're, we, we can bring somebody in. Let's bring, we were thinking about bringing Michael in, in residence and he can work with you on the piece and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, this is, that's great. And so he came and we were in residence. Um, he was in residence for a week or so at USC. Maybe it was two weeks. I can't remember. It might've even been longer. It might've been a month. I can't remember if there was a commission associated with it, but during that time, um, I worked with him a lot. Um, like Bill Kraft, Coming from a percussion background, he was super specific on you know the kinds of sounds. I mean, he, I mean, percussion composers, right? We, we, Casey knows. I mean, you know what sounds like in in a very very intimate way. So I had a lot of time working with him, and you know, as it turns out, that turns into a lot of dinners and a lot of other downtime where you get to get into philosophy, and um, he does some amazing things uh, apart from just the composition uh, that I've learned from him and then used. One, he's got a great book called My Lessons with Kumi um, that does right. so many amazing things about like if you're dealing with performance anxiety or finding your true self or finding identi identity or throwing energy or ways to really kind of self-analyze outside of your playing. That's amazing. The other amazing thing that he does that I've used a lot or, or used versions of kind of watered down versions, he does comp composition workshops with young people uh, where he goes into a school and then teaches graphic notation and, and gets, they don't not even, they don't even have to be music students. We've done it. Um, I've done like a, like I said, a very watered down version of it, even in some rural elementary school in Utah and just getting people interested and curious in sound and like how do you articulate bah, you know that sound like is it a big black dot on paper or how do you articulate like little things crawling and and so um, my time with him was really inspiring and and I, I've used that book with my students his hologram exercises how he thinks about how you can look at your playing it's uh, long and short of it is you can look at your playing not just from your perspective as a player but like somebody sitting in the audience a valued teacher sitting in the audience or somebody on like this idea of looking at how you throw your energy out as a performer and how that's perceived at different stages from here all the way out to the audience is is fascinating so i'm a big fan of, of michael Kogras and all of his work his music his writing his composition his workshops he's just so cool well we also had a facebook question we want to make sure to get to from jamie esposito and she says, Len is one of the best percussion ensemble coaches I've gotten to work with. Can you talk about your approach to teaching an ensemble, how to be time efficient during rehearsal, and how to keep everyone engaged? That's a great question. Hey, Jamie, thanks for writing in. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I love percussion ensemble, and I love the I, I love the 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 landscape, you know. Um, but in terms of rehearsals, I think that. Um, I always go back to how would I feel if I was in the group? And um, so everything that I do is trying to imagine like little Lynn in the ensemble and little Lynn, it was somebody who got bored really easily when she was a kid, you know? And so keeping everybody busy is, is important to me. And um, the other thing that I've worked on a lot that I think that um, everybody could stand to think about and I, this is not true when I'm talking like this because I say a lot and talk a lot, but in a rehearsal situation, I think economy of words is really important. Um, you know, to, to really say, um, what you need to say and to fix what you need to fix as clearly as efficiently as possible. Um, and, with that comes a certain kind of specificity. You know, if you, for example, if you have a take of something and it's like, let's say we're gonna, oh, let's do letter A to letter B. 
Okay. And then you just go, well, that was not clean. Like that doesn't, that's meaningless. Like what, how, how do I, if I'm little Lynn in the group, how do I, how do I fix that next time? You know? So I try to think like, um, very quickly, like in the moment, okay, what, what didn't I like about that? Or what was wrong with that? You know, and then try to isolate quickly ways to, to fix that. Um, I do a lot of breaking down of things, you know, I'll say like, okay, well, let me hear this group or this group. Um, and then, and try to fix very, very, very specific things. The other side of that is to always be prepared for rehearsals, you know, and, and I don't mean that I do a ton of score study. It's just, um, going in with a specific plan, you know, of, okay, I'm going to spend this much time making this piece better, you know, and, and it may not be everything, but I'm going to get, I need to, I need to fix this, you know? And so knowing that I want to hit that and then, and then hitting it with, with economy and specificity are, are things that I think about. Um, and then the word thing is really important. I, I can't tell you how many rehearsals I've witnessed where the, the, the person talks um, a lot or, or says the same thing. Okay, guys, 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 you know, you, you, like they'll say that over and over and over again. And the people tune out, you know, if, if you say, um, you know, such as if you give a comment and then you give it more than once, like, you know, you've been in situations like that, that you just start tuning it out. So, you know, if you're, if you're talking while people are setting up and tearing down, that's also like, it, it makes your voice, not something that's, heard or listened to. So, you know, let them set up and then give them a, like, okay, we're done. You're done setting up in five minutes. We're going to go. And then when that's time to go, go, you know, and then when you fix something or if you, you know, just, just say the thing that needs to be fixed and then, and then make sure they understand it, of course, but don't over and, and try not to duplicate like things more than one. So, so those are some tactics that I use. I mean, they're, they're common. I think a lot of people use them, but those are some of the things that I try to think about, you know, and mostly thinking about how would I feel if I was in there, you know, um, in that rehearsal. It came up a few episodes ago. We we're talking about some, maybe it was classroom teaching. And I, I, we were talking about, it's good when teachers do this and this and that. And it's, there's such a mystery to whether it goes well or not, because you can have two two teachers and they're both doing the same thing, but it's working so much better for the teacher that's doing it that matches their personality, right? You know, it's, yeah, it's so much about like your delivery, your personality. And by the way, speaking of little Lynn, I love this photo of you and and I guess your, your friend in a costume. It's great. <laughs> oh yeah, my website. I think that's where I was a drum major actually. You're definitely in a marching band uniform. I love how you look exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Little <limit. laughs> Anyway, very, very cool. Well, you guys, it's quiz time. So the score. Uh oh, did Ben just leave? Ben bailed for the quiz. Does that mean I automatically get all the points? I guess. Yeah, you automatically <laughs> win. Oh, this is bad. All right, we'll time out for a second. We'll get try to get Ben back. Ben, you here? Yeah, sorry, it just like completely froze and cut out for a minute, but oh, I'm back. No, that's okay. The timing timing was good, actually, because we were right in a little transition. Okay, guys, so we're going to do our second little review quiz for the podcast. Remember that you just have to wait till I'm done reading the question, and whoever answers first gets the points. If the answer came from your segment that you were reporting on, you'll only get half the points. So far, the score is 3-0 for favor of Laurel. So here we go. This collection of pieces in, is in four volumes and includes works by composers Milton Babbitt, Herbert Broom, Siegfried Fink, and John Cage. We spoke briefly about this collection with Tom Sherwood, and the collection is titled The... Noble Snare. I think we can safely say Ben got that. Yeah, that's right. This is the noble snare. Good job, Ben. 
So next question, as an homage to the Noble Snare collection, at Percussion Guest Sean Tilburg is currently publishing a new collection of snare drum solos plus playback or some kind of electronic element. This new collection will include new pieces from composers Andy Akiho, Joe Tompkins, Timo Andreas, myself, Casey Cangelosi, and what other at Percussion Guest? John Sathis. <laughs> Did I get it? Ben got that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I, did, I could. It's so fast. Good job, Ben. So I also would have accepted, and it did come up on John Sappis' episode just a few episodes ago, but I also would have accepted Ted Agcats, Paul Rennick, Michael Eagle, Lauren L. Lewis, and or Sean Tilburg. All of those people are writing pieces for this collection and they've all I'm been- I'm so excited episode. about that. I'm, that's gonna be so great. Yeah, I know, right? It's what a great all-star list. And you know, yeah. it's still it's still in some of the planning stages. I think he has agreements with all of us, but you know, I mean, lots some things could change, but that's so far the plan. And yeah, I agree. I'm so excited for it. So cool. Cool, all right, Ben, you're doing good. One more question. A few episodes ago, we had a Facebook question for the principal percussionist of the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, our friend Joshua Jones. Josh was asked if he has incorporated any Alexander technique into his practice and teaching methodology. He replied, no, he doesn't use Alexander technique, but instead has pursued an extensive interest in what other similar method? Feldenkrais. Yeah, you got it. Good job. That's a hard name to remember if you're not familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah, the Feldenkrais method. So the Feldenkrais method claims to recognize connections between the brain and the body, thus to improve your uh, your body movement and physiological state. Okay, cool. So that's that's two for Ben and two. No, sorry, that's three for Ben and two for Laurel. Which uh, which episode was the first question from? Way back on episode five with Tom Sherwood. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you guys, thanks so much for doing yet another one with us. And huge thanks to our guest, Lynn Vartan. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, guys, so much. It was a pleasure. I loved it. Very, very cool. Well, I look forward to seeing you at PASIC, assuming you're going to PASIC again. I hope so. <laughs> well, hey, best of luck with your travels and have a blast in Australia. And we'll catch you all later. Thanks. Cool. All right. Bye, everybody.